Hello everyone, uh, happy new year, happy 2024. And on behalf of IVA, Greater New York Affiliate, I wish you all uh, the best, uh, great health, success, and productive year ahead. We invite uh, speakers to empower Armenian women with the skills, with the information, with the tools so that they can use to make themselves better, to have a better self-care, self-help. One of those topics recently was researching about digital health and connected with our speaker today, Dr. Lernig, and we're trying to find out what are the tools, what are the new technologies that can help us to, to be at a better health or serve us for our health. Dr. Esai is the Associate Director for Digital Clinical and Patient Safety at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, she has been leading the Digital Health Initiative for over a decade. Besides holding leadership positions in many prominent companies like Northwell Health Network, which is the New York's largest healthcare provider, the RO, the telehealth company, Dr. Lernig, serves as a health affair leader uh, at the Red Cross for about six years, focusing on the improving uh, the quality and access for the care for the youth. Dr. Uh, Yesai graduated from Year One State Medical University, then continued her education in the United States and did her residency at Oregon Health and Science University. Then she moved to New York City, where she earned her master's degree in public administration in health policy and management at NYU. She's the executive vice president of the Armenian Digital Health Association and is working on the national digital health strategy for Armenia. I would like to note that Dr. Yesai offered her innovative ideas to passion the digital safety in Armenia, Digital Health Research Center. And congratulations on this, Dr. Yesai, because her innovation has been recognized as a winner according to the results of the Nerush 3.0 Diaspora Technology Startup Program. Dr. Yesai lives in Washington, D.C. and New York City with her newborn, and she's also a next-gen program mentor and advisor to a few healthcare startups. Dr. Yesai, welcome. And if you don't mind, I love the quote that you have in your email. If you don't mind, I would like to read it to our audience. I, as avid biohacker and also meditation instructor, I strongly resonated with that. It says, guard well within yourself that treasure, the kindness. Know how to give without hesitation, how to lose without regret, and how to acquire without meanness. George Sand from 1804. Uh, George Sand is a French novelist and journalist from 19th century. So a very strong quote. And with this, I welcome you. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you so much. It, it, it's an honor. And I was almost melting down here because of all the nice words. Thank you. Preparing for today's conversation, I was, I usually enjoy very much starting this kind of conversations, very intimate, more engaging the audience, you all with your experience with digital health in general and digital health in the context of personal care. So if, if you all don't mind, I would love to hear from you first, and then I will take, take it from there basically to understand where all you all are in terms of your uh, proximity to digital tools and specifically di digital tools for health care and self-care. Um, so we can start from there, whoever wants to go first, I would love to hear in your daily life or in your care in general, where do you use or interact with digital tools? And if you don't mind opening the parenthesis, what type of tools um, do you use? I'll go first. I use certain apps. I'm looking to see any apps that I can utilize. 
which are providing me certain kind of a program to follow. Like last year, I was using an app for intermittent fasting to see how it is working, right? And I really like that app because it is showing you where you stand within your time zone, where you stand with your fasting periods. I don't necessarily find it very accurate, let's say, the breakdown of the numbers because I think it's very individual. But overall, most of the programs, for me, at least the ones that I tried, gives you a good start to follow to watch your health, to your, watch your mental health and overall. I would love to have an application to do personal blood analysis, for example, to analyze the vitamin content in the blood. I would be very happy with that technology. Healthy people is very different than uh, if there is a specific uh, condition that we need to track or we need to have even medical uh, assistance. And we have two physicians here. They know and they do interactions with digital health, I'm sure on daily basis, which is EHR, communicating with patients, connecting with them, messaging, all of that is counted and it, it is under the umbrella of digital health. One thing that I do want to mention, you all mentioned about, I'm tracking my steps or sleep, et cetera. So it's very interesting to me to understand what is determining your tool, to, um, how do you trust, because at the end of the day, it's about your health. How do you trust the solution, a digital solution, a dig digital tool? I'm more than happy to go through a couple of items that you would need to look into. It would be something that it's on a regular basis. You should be looking out for, especially with the data privacy and all other threats to uh, patient care. We definitely want people to look out for. One of the things obviously is if the app or the solution is affiliated with any academic center, it could be a research center, it could be a hospital. Most of the apps, for example, Apple has developed or Google has developed have been in any in affiliation or work collaboration with the healthcare center or medical center. So that is very important. And another thing that you can look out for if it is just software company, looking at their board members, if there are any, usually they hire advisors, physicians. So that is extremely important to look at their website, see if there are physicians there. Another thing is how much the app or the solution is getting updated. Usually on their website, they put it, the updated versions come every six months or every uh, year or whatever that is. It's very important, at least healthcare apps related apps come in every at least reviewed once in a year so those are a couple of tips i don't know if you have ever thought that way but those are a couple of tips and stars the matter of stars are the almost the last thing to look out for for help, uh, when it comes to the healthcare apps and solutions and Any question there typically we start from the last one, as you mentioned, the stars, right? We look which one has uh, positive reviews, more stars, and uh, we go. I personally download and try and see if it works uh, for my needs. People go with the referrals. Let's say if the friend has mentioned something. Right. Um, or right, a physician or referral. Yep. Yeah, or a physician or a co-worker. It's a definitely valid way of approaching because for any other product, we do that. And it's not invalid. Uh, to follow the stars. It's just there are other criteria that you have to make sure first that there are what they say there there is a hand of a physician when that product has been uh, developed because at the end of the day clinicians and I'm not, a physician is very narrow scope but clinicians in general are involved in the development of the pro product is very important and that has been a trend that the healthcare organizations software companies there's a big trend of the hiring uh, medical professionals like myself that's how I ended up in this world that they rely on your opinion, your knowledge and expertise in clinical work from clinical work. So I highly encourage if you're track, if you're selecting an app or any solution, it could be a Fitbit on your hand or Apple Watch or whatever, definitely look for solutions that have are backed up by advisors, medical advisors, et cetera.
the the other thing is there depending on how much solution is related to the clinical intervention because all the tra step 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 tracking sleep pattern checking meditation those are all behavioral changes and behavioral tracking they are not necessarily as we in patient safety we call them they're not uh, prone to patient safety and they can't they can't necessarily there's never zero for patient safety risk but they can't have direct a uh, patient safety concern. So those are less of a, in a risk zone for individuals care. However, there are a lot of uh, digital solutions like lab kit that are sent home. Now I'm sure um, our physicians here uh, may know that the pap smear, you can even send the kit to, at home to do the pap smear, the colorectal cancer, you can do it at home. So all of this and record it digitally. So these are, these are very important interventions, digital interventions, that their accuracy is very important. Affiliation with the healthcare systems it are important. And of course, they are kind of a test that you can't buy online. It's It has to be prescribed and sent by hospital and healthcare system. So those are, I guess, criteria that I, I wanted to lay out for, for you when you're looking out for solutions. And I'm going to pause here if there are any thoughts or uh, questions, and then I can go from there. Take it from there. Any okay. questions? I have a question. Please. Of course, we need to research. We need to check the physicians to see which um, apps, which physicians are backing that up or which doctors are backing that up. Is there a way to, do you happen to know if there is a website, you know, for example, if it's the digital, if it's the smartphones, there is the scent.com that you go there and you check out what are the latest uh, smartphone technologies, what are the high reviews, et cetera, et cetera. Do you happen to know if there is any place, any website that one can go and yep. Perhaps yes, the, there is. The, That's a really good point. And there is, FDA has a website and I will I'll try to send it. The Center of Digital, don't quote me on the exact name of the center, but it's Center of Digital Solutions or something like that. They have a database that it records and it collects data in terms of where the solution was uh, developed, what kind of what what kind of certification the solution has, if there has been any market post market, what they call post market complaints or any kind of damage or anything that has been re reported, so they sent they keep it everything online and available. Everyone can access it, and I will try to find the link while we're speaking, and share. But that is, it's always, you know, when it comes to healthcare, it's tricky to rely on, I think someone said, I think it was RP said, scared of Googling. Exactly. It's scary because we, in medicine, we talk about asymmetry of information because truly you're on the one side, it's patient that doesn't have enough education and information about healthcare. And there, I mean, the people have different level of literacy, obviously, but around med around healthcare but usually speaking it's very much of a you rely on a professional to to guide you direct you so in healthcare decisions so with nowadays with google that has become such a thing a thing that even it's scary that people now with all the information that they have with the, their fitbits and apps of tracking their heart rate what are they doing with that information? So that's the next step of, okay, I have, I'm tracking my heart rate. What does it mean? And next place they go usually is Googling. Is 120 heart rate good for me? Should I be scared? Should I? And then internet is full of things. Someone with cancer writes and says, oh, well, you know, 120 was really bad when I had my chemo. The other person is like, oh my God, like, so the, that kind of information is really misleading people. That's why I guess I'm stressing how much it's important to check where the solution is coming from, but also what do you do with that information? It's very difficult. And again, I think our physicians on the call, we work with patients. It's around patient education that how do you use that information? 
If you see your heart rate goes up or your sleep pattern changes for a couple of days or for a couple of cycles, what does that mean? It does it mean you need to change anything? Is there any intervention needed or it's not needed? So all of it, again, it's you have to work with your provider. I would never leave people to make those decisions on their own unless they have medical medical education or healthcare background uh, just because the technology enable us it's like when you have it's, it's it's a little bit of a bold example but I always bring the knife example I'm like it's like a, you have a really good knife at home but you have to be careful how you're using the knife and if if you use it correctly it's I, I, I love having sharp knives for for fruits at home so if you 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 don't know how to use it you're going to harm yourself and mm, thankfully those kind of preventative apps and solutions like tracking your sleep pattern for smoking cessation etc those are less in obviously very much less invasive in terms of the intervention for your healthcare so that was a long answer to your question, but Anna, but I will definitely find the link and share it while we speak. Sure. I have found something. I don't know if this is what you meant. Is it the, the Digital Health Center of Excellence? Yeah, that's a center of excellence, but they have a database actually. It's within their uh, website that they have okay. a database. At least, at least this is where... That is the correct website. Okay, correct. I'll drop the mm-hmm. link in the chat. Thank you. Yep. At least this is something. Yeah, definitely. It's go a to and do some research. But at the end of the day, as much as Google scares some people, I do ask Google because with the AI and knowing how the AI and the large language models work, typically mm-hmm. those informations are pulled the same from the FDA website, right? The, the information is collected yeah. uh, from all over the web. And uh, yeah, as you said, it's uh, on one's discretion how far to go into the information and right. to know which are the reliable. I think looking at everything, it comes to a person being aware right yes being aware of themselves to recognize and to see what are the changes they are going through to and hint them that something is not right for example uh, years ago in the mornings i was waking up and my hands were so stiff i couldn't fold my fingers mm-hmm. And I didn't know what was happening. But uh, after a month, I'm like, no, this is too long. You know, it's been a month. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've been doing some garden work, etc. Then I came back, I went to the doctor, I did the blood test, nothing came up, everything was fine. And then a friend of mine, I knew that her mom had something and they did a biofeedback. Mm -hmm. And then I went to that center, they run different kind of frequencies, whereas Mm -hmm. it reads your organs frequency. And based on that, I'm laughing uh, at the results because I just came back from Armenia Mm -hmm. and I missed Gata and village yogurt so much that for the last month, I was literally eating every single So Mm -hmm. when this doctor showed me the report, I started laughing. She's like, "Uh, what's funny about that? I said, the four important things that I love, it's on the top of the chart and is out of uh, norm. Mm -hmm. So apparently the yogurt with gata was the thing that was giving me that stiffness. Uh, It increased inflammation Mm -hmm. environment in my body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I stopped for six months. I'm back. I'm occasionally eating, but seems like my body... Had too much yogurt. My point is to be aware. Absolutely. And to understand their body and based on that, compare the information, what resonates uh, with their issues. I mean, as I mentioned, exactly that information asymmetry that traditionally, conventionally, we have seen in doctor's office, patient would have come with having no idea and whatever you would say, they would take it for granted we don't have that now. We have patients coming with much more specific questions, patient coming informed, and sometimes even they teach you because they have been doing enough of updated research and sometimes physicians even don't have that much time to get the most updated and collected. As you said, AI gives that collected information, which sometimes we as physicians don't get 
to have that time to collect and add our clinical judgment. So definitely that is a really good side of a technology. And I would stress AI has that advantage, not necessarily Google search because AI gives that, provides that collective data. And I very much appreciate that at the end, always it says it's very individual and talk to your provider <laughs> before making any decisions. So that, that, that at least as a courtesy, it's, it's much appreciated. You know, at the end of the day, I think of being aware of the limitations that the tools provide is very important, but the challenge is being aware what is the limitation of the tools, generally speaking, because you, again, you have to be kind of a little bit tech savvy, kind of a little bit understanding your care, uh, understanding healthcare, clinical, little bit, having clinical understanding a little bit to understand, okay, if I'm seeing heart rates going up and the app shows it is up and it's red, but I feel good. Um, otherwise, we I always remember one of my attendings would say, we don't treat labs, we treat patients. So that is very important, meaning we don't go with your heart rate. If it's high, make a big deal out of it. If otherwise you're healthy, otherwise your body tolerates it, otherwise you don't have any complaints. It's the same, uh, same, same rules for the rest of the apps. You see your sleep cycle changes. And again, it goes back to the fact that digital health is new, is infant. It's in its infancy and there are not many, when we look for myself, I'm very interested in patient safety around the digital solutions and it's extremely scarce data around compared to traditional patient safety, a scarce data around solutions and the patient safety risks that they, they, they can cause. And FDA has has put a lot of effort to predict risks based on a type of a solution like apps versus interventions that are like labs are sent home or even EHR, um, how you're using the EHR information. They're all in much more uh, invasive in direct impact on the healthcare uh, of a person. So I guess knowing, acknowledging the limitation is a very, very much of an important part of uh, using digital tools. Um, obviously, patient privacy is big thing nowadays, cybersecurity. Another thing is what we call the noise, clearing the no data noise. We are entering so much data nowadays into our apps and solutions that we have, home monitors, that for physicians, clinical team also clearing from that noise what is important to track is also have bec has become a, a task and challenge because we are collecting so much data from patients. And even for healthy people, when they track um, their different metrics, um, the first question is which one, as I said, which one is true to pursue and understand and which one we should let go. So data noise is very much of a of an important issue and with it comes the data management understanding what part of the data should be used to track the patient what we call nowadays patient data phenotyping meaning we're trying to build that phenotype of a person that the data gives us and it's so important to know from that data which part is valid information and worth pursuing versus not. So those are the challenges that you're facing with, with the digital uh, solutions right now. Patient safety always is a concern for sure, but it's more of a FDA is taking that responsibility for when they are certifying uh, certain solutions. However, they're like the apps that most of most people use, regular apps for tracking sleeps or tracking heart rate or steps, those do not need or do not require FDA certification. So they are just because they are counted as the lowest risk for patient safety. So FDA doesn't necessarily certify them. However, the company still can apply for getting FDA, what they call approval, but it's not certification because it doesn't apply to them, to their 
solution. The, the, there are second category of solutions that are for information. They provide information for decision making. So those are mostly for clinicians um, or healthcare providers. So those are a category that patients don't even interact with. It's more on a provider side for medical decision making. So those are a category that FDA starts to certify, monitor, and post-market monitor the evolution of the solution, basically in terms of patient safety. So, so the, those are the patterns that, and then comes the last and the highest risk interventions that are only solely implemented within hospital settings and with, within inpatient settings. Right. Quick question. Is there any particular personal information that uh, people should be aware of not to put for the safety purposes, right? Not to put in any app because when I was testing different apps, trying to find the one that I need, almost all of them ask extensive questions, you know, not only about where you live or your finances, but then it goes really deep into your personal health questions or sometimes even relationship-related questions, right? Mm -hmm. Which I understand could be, for some of the things could be. But is there any particular information that we should not enter? Because most of the time, this information sort of are optional, but uh, intuitively people put, because they think more information they put, more correct the picture is referral right. they will get or something, right? right. So from the application itself. And given that safety concerns, mm -hmm. is there mm -hmm. anything we should be really yeah. cautious um, yeah, that definitely comes to comes back to cybersecurity and patient privacy concern, category of concerns. And the rule of thumb is do not enter um, unique identifiers, meaning, for example, uh, social security, because it's unique to you, facial parameters or facial re for facial recognition or et cetera. Those are the unique identifiers. If the identifier is indirectly unique, meaning it's your name, it's your last name, but the combination is unique, the rule of thumb is don't put three information, three pieces of a, a unique information together, together, like your name, last name with your date of birth or your name, last name uh, with your city that you live or something that, uh, that, because that combination, so what the AI hackers do is you know they're finding those trends in your patient data. I'm sorry, you're on mute. Pardon me. Are you referring, let's say, not to put the full name? Let's say if it's Anna Bennett, I just put A Bennett or Ann Bennett. I would recommend so you 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 can put a name and last name. So name and last name together are still not. Can it be just instead of my real name? Can I just put Josh Mo? I all, almost I I I use I do use apps for my personal health tracking, and I almost never use my full name. Regardless, I mean they're both uh, associated with Mayo Clinic. Like in term, I'm I'm trusting the app, but it's a rule of thumb for putting data in internet. At the end of the day, it's internet, and it it's the in the cloud, so hackers can access it. I would recommend if you don't necessarily, if it's not, for example, your EHR, that you have to affiliate with your correct answers. It's a personal app that you're using or another personal solution and uh, Apple Watch or anything like that, that it's personal. It's not affiliated with, the, with your hospital or clinic that you're working with or getting your care. I would highly recommend using either fake names or something that it's not definitely unique identifier for you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nernik, you've used EHR multiple times. What does it stand for? Oh, well, my, my apologies. Electronic health records. Sorry, it's my <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> conversation. Electronic health records or uh, medical health records. They're both. Epic is one of the pro most prominent ones that in US almost six, don't quote me on this, but I think around 60 to 70% of healthcare systems are using Epic. 
electronic health records. Yeah, I use an app called MyChart that captures yes, all the right. lab yep. test information exactly. affiliated with hospitals. Exactly. And that is Epic's patient portal, basically, that is called my chart. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. That, that is a trusted, I mean, I know hospitals are dealing with hacking hackers, hacking their EHR system also. So nothing is safe in this world anymore, <laughs> to be honest, but how we can lower the risk of our data to not get lost or stolen is again, as I said, if it's affiliated with with the credible healthcare system that lowers the risk, obviously, and not do not use uh, unique identifiers. And if you use your name or last name, try to change either letter or, you know, use a short name or something like that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Of course. Other questions? Uh, or any comments? Activity. A little bit. I question, comment, point of interest. You mentioned your work in Armenia briefly yes. in your introduction. I'm curious what your experience has been with, you know, folks there and their adoption of such oh, yeah. technology mm -hmm. or the prevalence availability and what the trajectory of that of that area is. If you can speak to that, I know we don't Absolutely. have much time left, but. Oh yeah, I, I I can talk about it for days. It's been my light light of my life. <laughs> it's been such a learning journey. Uh, I lived in Armenia. I did my med medical school there. I'm not from Armenia, but I lived there. And uh, for 2019, four years ago, I joined the Armenian Digital Health Association. And the initiative was is is it, the initiative now is an independent project. It's not anymore under the umbrella of the association. No, but it's been a long, very long uh, journey. We did a study last year, basically it's a feasibility study to provide what are the best ways to approach implementing digital health as a national strategy for healthcare, uh, providing healthcare. But uh, not only for, for addressing healthcare issues, but also economic benefits of it, basically. Because in Armenia, I mean, it all, like U.S., unfortunately, healthcare outcomes are very poor. For U.S., unfortunately, because I'm, I'm sure you have heard once in your life, at least, that U.S.'s healthcare outcomes are one of the lowest within within developed countries. So... In Armenia, we have that burden of non-communicable disease, which is very significant in terms of the the GDP and the government spendings on non-communicable diseases. So I am part of a team that came up with, with the strategy suggesting how to approach what 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 should be the approach basically if we want to implement on a national level. I personally engineer the model for the solution, actual solution. And right now we're working with the ministry to hopefully push it forward to implement. It's a, it's a massive implementation. So it's been taking us four years, but we're ho hopeful we are there uh, because we are now in, the con in, in conversation with the ministry. The challenge in Armenia, like in the U.S., is that there are a lot of in silo technology solutions because it's been on a private level, not on a national and you know government level. However, one thing that is a really big advantage for Armenia is Armenia has its own electronic health record EHR system. They built in-house. It's a very, it's almost uh, 10 years old, almost 10 years old. Um, it's a really good foundation for us to use leverage that for a national for implementing a national health strategy because the the skeleton of a digital health is electronic health records in in healthcare so we have that in armenia thankfully it's very limited compared to what we have here in us with the epic for example it's very limited with its features but it's a really good foundation so we are very hopeful that that could be a stepping stone for us. I am periodically presenting updates on Armenian American Medical Association meetings on the initiatives um, 
progress, but anytime that I'm invited to these conversations, I also share updates. So we're, that's where we are right now, but thanks for asking. It's sure. my yeah, passion. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. It's intriguing both on a personal and professional level. So Do you think I'm, I'm the Armenian hear. program could be compatible with EPIC? It, it depends on what level on, I think with its, because we have so many advantages as a small country that big countries don't have that. And actually, I was reading in Economist this morning, Armen, there was an article about what we can learn from small countries. And Armenia was featured, actually, Ar 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 Armen Sarkisian was featured in that article that, unfortunately, we failed to, to leverage what we could be a model as a small country. So definitely in healthcare, we have that, that advantages. We ha I'm very, very positive and hopeful for our EHR, electronic health record, to be the base. But if we develop it well, it will be compatible for, and I mean, EPIC is one of the front frontiers, but definitely with EPIC, yeah. Great. We're at the hour, but I have one more question, if you don't mind. Please. Um, Given given the fact that uh, you have a newborn, I'm curious if there are any apps that uh, you're utilizing monitoring the health of your baby so that we can share with our mm -hmm. audience, you know, young mo moms who have newborns at this digital age when they're looking for all different kinds of applications and solutions to help them with it. Yeah. I, to be very honest, I'm very skeptical to most of the apps in US. <laughs> and it looks like end of pregnancy, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I, but I have this, these both apps are NHS from UK, a national health center in UK developed. They are amazing. They're, you can, you, they, everyone can use them for free. I use the premium just because with premium, they have couple of features that was very important for me. Like they have yoga for pregnant women that it was very important for me. Amazing to, to apps A to Z about pregnancy, following your pregnancy, learning educational material. So really good apps. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, what was the name? I'm sorry if I missed. I, I just put it in the chat. Pregnancy Plus and Baby Plus. Oh, okay. So those are the names of the apps. Yes. Okay. Baby oh. Plus, you, it, it is obviously when the baby is born, but I did pregnancy plus throughout my pregnancy. And then when Nubar was born, I did what baby plus. Okay, cool, cool. And you said it's a UK developed program, yeah? Yeah, yep. It's, it's yeah, UK based NHS from National yeah. Health System in, in UK. Yep. Well, this was uh, quite enlightening session. I learned a lot uh, and I believe we touched a very important point about digital health and how the technology could be leveraged to boost our self-care. And of course, the cybersecurity concerns are the number one to mm -hmm. the takeaways, right? Always check the physicians whenever you're uh, thinking of using the application, do a little bit research, see which physicians, which doctors are backing up that particular application and check their credibility to see if it's good for you. The other thing was the cybersecurity, especially these days that we're in a trial, we're testing, trying, but uh, every time putting personal information is just we're giving too much of our personal data to all different kinds of sources that we don't know how will be used for us or against us. So unless it's medically necessary, you're in the hospital or at your doctor's office, Dr. Learning SI uh, advises to put different name, made up name or some <laughs> something different, but so that all your information is the, the date of birth, the first name, the, uh, the last name, or the middle name, so that uh, the hackers will not have a complete information of yourself by any means to try to harm you. Dr. Yesai, thank you so very much for your time coming to Iva Greater New York Affiliate session today and giving us so much information about the technology and self-care. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.